Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Anderson, President and CEO of Zions Bank. And it's my honor to welcome all of you to our community speaker series on building economic inclusion. Today's topic is of the utmost importance because of the impact it has on the livelihood and the lives of people. A truly inclusive economy gives everyone the opportunity to prosper. I want to again bring our attention to the Utah Compact on Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. This compact was launched in December of last year by Governor Herbert and a diversity of community leaders across the state in an effort to lay the foundation for bringing the vision of one Utah to life. If you or your organization have not yet signed on to this compact, I urge you to do so. I want to take a moment to define the word compact, which means to make or enter into a formal agreement with another party or parties. And the key term here, I believe, is formal agreement. For far too long, far too many of us have gone about the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion far too casually. And that is why we continue to see the economic disparities that remain in the communities that we serve. I urge you again to enter into this compact and formally commit to making this work a top priority. You can sign on by going to the Salt Lake Chamber website. I encourage you to not just sign this compact, but to acknowledge what the formal commitment means to allow the values and principles laid out in the compact, acknowledgement, engagement, commitment, and investment to inform our work and to inspire the manner in which we listen, learn, and lead. Now for today's panel, I'm so excited to have them here with us. We are truly honored to hear from some of the key economic power players in the great state of Utah. And I want to thank each of our panelists, Robert, Jennifer, Miles, Teresa, and Dan, for taking the time to share their perspectives, their experiences, and their insight on how we can work together to build economic inclusion and to ensure that every individual has a truly equal opportunity to prosper. They are all busy people, so I'm excited for the opportunity to hear from all of them in one conversation. I also want to thank our One Zions team, who's responsible for organizing, promoting, and producing today's event. And I want to thank all of you, valued members of our community who have chosen to Zoom in today to listen, learn, and lead out on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you again for joining us. Building economic inclusion begins with us, it begins with me, and it begins with you. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to Sue Lang Pinoke, our Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, who will share a recap of our speaker series so far this year and serve as co-host with Robert Spenlove for today's event. Sue Lang. Thank you, Scott, for that warm welcome and for your visionary leadership and commitment to this work inside and outside of the bank. One thing I've grown to admire about Scott Anderson is his ability to simultaneously see both the big picture as well as the role of individuals in bringing the vision of economic inclusion to life. In today's conversation, we hope to dive deeper into both perspectives and experiences. Now, for those of you who are tuning into our community speaker series for the first time, we wanted to take a moment to share a brief recap of the conversations we've hosted so far this year that have led us to the conversation we'll be having today. On February 25th, in honor of Black History Month, we launched our Power Speaker series with an NFL panel exploring the intersection of race, sports, and economic inclusion, featuring Steve Smith, Haloti Nada, and Lorenzo Alexander. 
on March 30th in honor of Women's History Month and honoring all of the women leaders who have made history and continue to make history in our communities, we hosted a conversation with Colonel Janice M. Carroll, the first black woman to serve as installation commander of Hill Air Force Base, the largest single site employer in the state of Utah. On April 20th, in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month, we welcome Dr. Mark Rappaport into Utah's community as he resumes his role as CEO of the Huntsman Mental Health Institute. HMHI is doing groundbreaking work in the world of mental health, not just in Utah, but across the country and around the world. In June 22nd, in honor of Pride Month, we hosted a Pride panel featuring community leaders representing the LGBTQIA plus community, exploring ways in which we can work together to create cultures of inclusion in the communities that we serve. Now, we believe all these community conversations will bring us closer to building economic inclusion. And going back to our formal commitment to the Utah Compact on Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, there are four policy priorities laid out in the compact, education, employment, housing, and healthcare. And our vision is to use the Zions Bank Community Speaker Series as a platform to host conversations with community leaders who are opening opportunity and increasing access to education, employment, housing, and healthcare. And to echo what Scott stated earlier, there's a specific role that banks and financial institutions play in the bigger picture of achieving true equality in America, and that is economic inclusion. Now, economic inclusion is not my term or Scott's term, it is the term that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to describe the vision he had for America in his The Other America speech. After the March on Washington, he began organizing what was called the Poor People's March that was going to deliver over a quarter of a million poor people to our nation's capital. It was a multiracial effort, including African Americans, white Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, and indigenous people. Dr. King wasn't just fighting for racial justice for people of color in this country. He was fighting for economic justice for all Americans. And that is why we are all here today, to carry on Dr. King's legacy in 2021 and beyond. Now, we may each represent different social cultural, racial, ethnic, regional, religious, political, and economic backgrounds, but we come together with a common vision to do our part in realizing Dr. King's dream to build economic inclusion. Now, I felt the need to set up today's conversation by providing the historical context that has led us to where we are today. It is easy to forget and critically important to remember how far we've come to honor the sacrifices that were made so that we can enjoy the freedoms we have today. Now, y'all ready? Let's get to work. I am truly honored to introduce our speakers for today's event, starting with my co-facilitator, Robert Spenlove. Robert Spenlove is our economist here at Zions Bank, and his role and responsibility is to provide an economic outlook and economic updates for the bank and the community. Welcome, Robert Spinlove. Uh, I also want to introduce Jennifer Robinson, Associate Director of the Kim Gardner Policy Institute. Uh, now, the Institute's role is to produce economic data and research, and Jennifer has played a leading role in producing the Diversity in, data, uh, Diversity in Utah data book, which we will dive into a lot deeper throughout this conversation. Also want to introduce Miles Hansen, President and CEO of World Trade Center Utah. World Trade Center celebrates its 15th anniversary this year. So happy birthday. WTC's role is supporting Utah businesses in going global. Next is Teresa Foxley, CEO of the Economic Development Corporation of Utah, also known as EDC Utah. And their role is to bring business to the state of Utah. And Dan Hemmert, the executive director of the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity, formerly known as GoEd. Now I've been describing it as GoEO. <laughs> it's got a ring to it. Uh, and Dan's responsibility is responsibility is huge. Uh, it is essentially the overall economic livelihood of the great state of Utah. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's conversation. I'm going to pass the mic to Robert so he can open up today's conversation with all of you. Thanks so much, Sui Lang. It's uh, great to be with you today, and it's great to have such a, a, a wonderful panel of, uh, of experts. So what I want to do is let's just kind of start off 
at the at the high level. Let's kind of frame this discussion. Uh, and I want to go around to each one of you and have you answer the questions. So Sui Lang mentioned uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's definition of what economic inclusion is to him, but I want to find out what it is to you. Uh, what what does economic inclusion mean to you um, at both an individual level and a community level? Uh, let's start off with Jennifer. Oh, hey, thanks, Robert. I think Sui Lang did just a perfect job in describing the vision of Dr. King and our history. And I think my beliefs are aligned perfectly with that. I see uh, economic inclusion as meaning that every single person in our world has um, the opportunity to reach their full potential. And that any types of constraints, um, factors like your religion, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, are just removed from that, from that equation. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Miles, let's go to you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And so like, I could listen to you tee this up this conversation all day long. <laughs> Phenomenal job. Hey, I learned uh, quite a few new things. I've been taking notes. And so I just honored it to be part of this. Robert, to your question, we all know that Utah's economy is performing better than any uh, economy in the nation, many economies around the world. It is a phenomenal uh, experience as a state to have this type of prosperity happening. And yet at the same time, it's absolutely essential that we all acknowledge that not all segments of Utah's population are participating in the success to the same degree. And so to echo what Jennifer said, when I think of economic inclusion, what that means to me is that it shouldn't matter what uh, what your ethnic background is, your religious background, what zip code uh, you're from, um, in order to have the same level of opportunity to go out there to compete in the marketplace and to participate in the success that Utah's economy has had. And so from the World Trade Center Utah perspective, what that means to us is that we need to over-index our outreach to those segments of the population, those parts of the state that have not participated to the same degree in this economic success. And those have to be our top priorities for the various services and grants and programming that we provide so that we can be very intentional to reaching out and to try to support businesses and individuals uh, within these communities and try to bring them into this economic, uh, th this wave of economic success that is uh, that, that the state's currently experiencing right now. Thanks, Miles. And just kind of a follow up, I heard recently there are uh, 200 different languages spoken in Utah. I think that's correct. I mean, so you can just see that diversity that exists in our state. Um, and I think you have a great point. Um, Teresa, uh, what do you think? Well, again, thank you so much for, for hosting us today. Echo much of what has already been said. But, you know, from our perspective, uh, EDC Utah in 2019 added a vision statement to our longtime mission. And our vision is a quality job for every aspiring Utah. And really that aspiring is a, is a play on words. It's for, for those both who are aspiring to something better, but those also who are aspiring to become part of Utah. And the vision really speaks to our team. It speaks to our partners, but it was so important for us as an organization to have a, a people focused vision. Because uh, as has been said before, while we enjoy this amazing economy, not everyone is enjoying it to the same extent. So uh, we've learned so much over the last couple of years, the, the uneven impact of the pandemic, the data book that I hope Jennifer will be going into great depth on today. But this newfound awareness really charges us to be committed to find a way to make sure that Utahns benefit from that prosperity in a way, and to use Scott's word, that we're, that we're more intentional about this. Um, so we, we have set a goal that Utah be the most uh, inclusive economy in the country. And for us, that means, uh, again, what is, has been said in, in various different ways previously, but it won't matter your zip code. It won't matter where you worship, your gender, your ethnicity, the color of your skin, that you can fully participate in Utah's economy through attaining a great education and having fabulous opportunities uh, in, in your career to start and build a business. That's great. I love that term, people-focused vision. That's really good. Uh, and Dan, let's uh, uh, go to you. What do you think? It's hard to be last after everyone said something. Uh, I mean, but you can everyone be said, the legislature, so you're a speaker. You can just oh, talk. I don't know. I can probably go for 45 minutes right now. No, um, but uh, uh, what everyone said is is wonderful. And I'm going to play off some of the things that, like Teresa mentioned. You know, she mentioned they updated their uh, mission statement, vision statement internally. Uh, you know, our office, formerly the 
uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development, one of the first things that we did, uh, thanks to the legislature's willingness to change it in statute, was to change our name to the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. And it's only a one word change, but it is a fundamental shift in focus. And I love what Teresa said. I'm going to play off that as well. Namely, it's when you talk about economic development, you think of buildings, you think of projects, you think of companies, you think of very impersonal activity, economic activity. When you think of opportunity, you're naturally uh, focused on people. And uh, part of our emphasis going forward in the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity is to think about people. And then to get back to your question specifically, what does inclusion look like? You know, uh, one of the, um, I think, part of the culture of America since its founding is, is an attempt to be more of a meritocracy. And a meritocracy that does strip away um, lines that separated us historically, be they race, you know, sexual orientation, gender, whatever, age. Um, and so uh, I think whatever we can do culturally as a community to, uh, you know, embrace truly, you know, uh, trying to help those groups that, that historically have not had the same economic outcomes that others have had. You know, Scott mentioned this compact at the beginning, and, and I do think that's where it starts. Uh, you know, so what is inclusion? It is, it is opportunity for everyone, irrespective of those, those factors that sometimes we, we use to separate each other. Um, but on top of that, you know, well, I guess I'm not going to answer any other questions. I have other things to say when we get to it, but um, it, that's what inclusion means to me is that, you know, if you think of a circle, we're all inside of it and we all have the same opportunities to, to pursue and achieve upward economic mobility. And uh, I think that's part of this today's topic and it's exciting to be part of it. No, that's a great point. I love that you said, you know, changing one word in your title can be a total paradigm shift. And that's really important. Um, my only complaint, though, is I'm still trying to figure out what your new acronym is. <laughs> well, you can say, I'm not supposed to say this still, but GOEO, I predict, give it six months, we're GOEO all the time. Uh, in statute, it's Go Utah because when we switched from GOED to go, yo, there was something about going from a consonant to a vowel that was disturbing to people, but um, uh, go, yo works, and I think that's where we'll be long-term. Well, we're excited about it. Uh, Sui Lang? Thanks so much, Robert and Dan. I've been socializing go, yo, uh since I learned about the change, and thanks so much for providing context. Uh, one word absolutely can make the difference, um, and, and I've already felt it, so kudos to you in the governor's office on uh, economic opportunity. Um, now, going back to the original theme of today's conversation, building economic inclusion, data, policy, and impact. And we would like to guide today's conversation in that order, starting with data. Um, now, the conversations Scott and I and other leaders here at the bank have had around defining economic inclusion, and we wholeheartedly agree with everything everyone has shared so far, um, love the diversity of thought and approach to economic inclusion that also speaks to the power of diversity, equity, and inclusion at its most advanced levels. Um, but defining it, a lot of our conversations have largely been centered around the four policy priorities uh, outlined in the Utah Compact. Economic inclusion isn't just throwing money at the problem, right? There are so many other factors involved, education, employment, housing, and healthcare. And this is where the diversity in Utah data book comes into play. Uh, now, the main takeaway, and Jennifer, thank you so much for all of your hard work you and the Institute have done in putting together um, this data book. Uh, the main takeaway I got from the data book is Utah's population is becoming more and more diverse uh, based on a number of social, racial, ethnic, regional, educational, health, and economic factors. Uh, and just to name a few, one in four Utahns identifies as a person of color. I, I think it was last week, I was just saying one in five, right? That is huge. Predicted to increase to one in three by 2060. Now that sounds a whole lot like uh, Utah becoming like California. Uh, so this diversity, ethnic and racial diversity is happening. Utah is the youngest state in the nation, highest percentage of millennials, second only to Washington, DC. Uh, Utah also has the highest population growth in the country over the past 10 years. So my question to you, Jennifer, describe to us what the diversity in Utah data book actually is. How are you socializing it with the community and what else does it reveal? Oh, happy to. I'm glad to spend a little time with everybody and talk about this. I think it's one of the most important pieces of work that's come out of the University of Utah. 
and certainly out of the Gardner Institute. So we released it back in May, just a few months ago. And I should mention that it was work that was requested by community leaders, and it was actually sponsored by Zions Bank. So a big thank you to Zions Bank for being interested in better understanding who lives in our state and some of the differences among our population. The data book really dives into three things. We're looking at race, ethnicity, and gender in our state. And we're looking at the factors around the economy, education, healthcare, and housing. So the same things that you have in the compact, right? The same concerns that are in the compact. And the the big message is there are some significant disparities among racial and ethnic groups in the, on those four factors and between men and women. And we could dive into it um, if you'd like, but the, the real value of the data book is that it provides something useful, a baseline, if you will, that helps in the conversations that are occurring all throughout our state, conversations in government, conversations among business leaders. So we can just make some progress. And we're very hopeful at the Gardner Institute because we think when you combine data with all the success that we already have in our state, all of the great things that we already have in our state, we're gonna make a lot of progress on some of these disparities. So we like, as you know, we have about almost 3.3 million people. That's the new census data number that came out. Our population is growing really, really fast in this state. In the last 10 years, we grew like 18%. That's a massive amount of growth. The rest of the country is growing at like 7.4%. Big, big Mm -hmm. difference. And you mentioned that we're becoming a more diverse state. No doubt about it. Just a few years ago, we were saying 23% of our population identified as minority. Mm -hmm. The latest census number that came out two weeks ago, it's at 25%. And we're projecting, you know, about 36%, 35, 36% of our population will be minority in the next 40, less than 40 years. So a lot of change comes into our state and we just really have to understand, know who lives here and to make progress on issues, you've got to have good data. And I think the data book is that baseline for our community. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for outlining um, all of that for us. Truly exciting, all these changes that are happening uh, here in the Beehive State. Also want to recognize the importance of data, right? Oftentimes you hear that term data-driven, data this and that. I know economists take data very uh, seriously, so do policymakers, so do business leaders. Um, Talk to us why data is so important and what role does it play in the policymaking process? Because we we all know how important policy is in shaping the way in which we live our lives. Well, maybe we should ask Robert and Dan to jump in on that question, right? Yes, really to any legislative experience and ask them, like, why is it so valuable to have something from Gardner that I think is reliable, trustworthy, Mm -hmm. and how it it helps you to make good decisions at the policy level, right? Rather than uh, making decisions by anecdote or what you might have experienced, you have something really solid to work from. So I'll hand Jennifer, it over. I would love to hear from Dan. Why is data important to policy? And then spend love. Why is data important as an economist? Well, uh, I, I actually think Jennifer said it right. Okay, despite popular opinion, the legislature doesn't always make decisions not based on anecdote. I know that was a really awkward sentence, but uh, <laughs> too often uh, w- bills will be run based on an anecdotal story from a neighbor or constituent. And and um, that's not a great way to get great statewide policy, right? And having data from a credible source that uh, is expansive and like, so sorry, I'm looking over my screen. I have the, the diversity in Utah data book open on my screen right here next to me, but um, it's, it, it, it is statewide. And I remember right before this got published, Natalie Gochner called me and said, hey, we're about to release this. And just FYI, there's, not, there's some not great trends in here. And uh, that's great. And, and we need to know that because if you don't, it's hard to try to fix it. And we live lives uh, for good or for bad uh, with blinders on. We live lives in our, in, from our personal perception and our personal you know, interaction with the world. And you kind of need this data or data from a credible source to help you take those blinders off and, and, and see outside of your immediate you know, experience. And so 
you know, it's invaluable to have this data and it protects us from making, from the legislature, I think, from making laws based on anecdotes, which is not, a, again, not a great way to make policy. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Spin love. So uh, all I'd add to that is not only is data essential to the policymaking process, but it, it needs to be data from a credible source. Uh, because, you know, we're get, uh, there's data coming out all the time and there's statistics coming out all the time, uh, but a lot of those are not trusted sources. And so it's so important to have sources that uh, ha- have a, a track record of accuracy that, that, um, that, that we know that we can count on. Uh, now, the, the struggle when you're working with this kind of data is there's always going to be errors, whether we like it or not, there are errors. That's why we make revisions. That's why we uh, produce new data often. Um, but if you know that you have a source like the, the Gardner Institute, it has just been such a, a wonderful uh, resource for the state of Utah. Uh, it, it gives us that confidence to be able to move forward with more, uh, uh, more accuracy. Thank you so much, Robert. And it's so important to, I mean, trust, right? Plays a critical role in this whole creating an inclusive economy equation. Uh, So many uh, people in our communities don't trust the government or they don't trust corporate America or they don't trust certain data, right? So throwing this back to you, Jennifer, how how is it that, why can we trust uh, the data that's coming out of the Kim Gardner Policy Institute? What does that look like? What does a trusted data source mean? Yeah, uh, it's a, that's a great question. We're quite careful about the data that we use. So much of our data comes from the Census Bureau and um, we're really transparent in how we report the data as well. So if somebody, a policymaker, a business leader looked at our data, they would certainly see the source on everything that we have. We also put in what we call whiskers or a confidence interval so that you can see the range of where the error might exist. So when Robert looks at the data or Dan or anyone else looks at the data, they can say, oh, it's likely to be at this point, this should be the number, but there's a range of where the actual number could be. I think that's really important because it it gives them a sense that not with survey data, survey data has errors in it, right? And the data that we rely on has errors. And you just have to be very cautious and cognizant where that data can be erroneous and it can have some ranges. And I think um, the the key for us is relying on good data sources, census data and others that are helpful to us. And then being transparent when you report your data so that policymakers and decision makers can see, um, see what they can really trust and understand. Agreed, agreed. Another piece too is people can manipulate data, right? To tell a narrative or story that that fuels their agenda. Um, And I've really appreciated how how public and open, transparent the Institute is being with the data book, with the Diversity in Utah data book. Just wanted to show our audience, this is what it looks like. This is a fancy printed copy version of this. As Scott stated earlier, if you would like a copy of these, feel free to just reach out, send me your information, happy to drop one in the mail for you. Um, So thank you so much, uh, everyone talking about data. Let me throw this back to Robert to dive into the policy conversation. Thanks, Siri Lang. Okay, so we, we kind of set the foundation, which is uh, the, the importance of the data, but data is only important to the extent that it can help inform policymaking. And so let's let's go into the, the, the policy area. Um, and this is just kind of the, uh, like Siri Lang said, the, the beginning of the discussion. Each, each one of these major areas, you know, she talked about employment, housing, healthcare, and education. Each one of those could be its own, you know, seminar. And so we won't be able to get into all the nuances of each one, but what I'd like is to uh, have each one of you just kind of uh, give a, a, a brief overview of some of the struggles and some of the areas where we're really trying to, uh, uh, to focus on improving economic inclusion in these areas. So uh, let's start off with uh, employment. And Teresa, I'm gonna have you take this one. Um, So, and let's go back to the data. 
Um, so looking at the latest jobs report from the Department of Workforce Services, one of the most trusted data sources in the state of Utah, uh, employment uh, growth over the last two years in Utah was 4.2%. Uh, Utah is one of only two states that has added jobs since the beginning of the pandemic, Utah and Idaho. And our unemployment rate has dropped down to 2.6%, so extremely low unemployment. However, when you look at labor force participation or the percent of the population that's actually working or looking for a job, it's still not back to that pre-pandemic level. So what, what, what we're identifying is a disconnect. There's a disconnect uh, of, of the availability of jobs and the uh, ability of people to, and interest of people to actually take those jobs. So how do we address this? Well, first I'd love your thoughts about why we're seeing a disconnect. Um, and then how do we address this? How do we create the right kind of jobs uh, uh, to attract and retain good talent and also to help those uh, that uh, have been uh, traditionally uh, disconnected? Well, Robert, thanks so much for setting the stage here. We really have had just absolutely expectation defying job growth uh, over the over the past two years, over the past decade, really. And it is not without its challenges, of course, because you have employers who uh, would like to hire more. They would like to invest in a great place like the state of Utah, which is incredibly stable. Uh, but we often hear that uh, finding the right talent can be a challenge. And so um, compliments to those on, uh, on this call and others who have been involved in trying to crosswalk uh, those who have dropped out of the of the workforce and who are not participating in our economy to the level that they should be through uh, workforce training and, and workforce development programs like the Learn in Utah program, like the Work in Utah program and other programs that uh, were augmented uh, during the pandemic. That work has been incredibly important and we need to keep our eye uh, and our focus on ensuring that the skills that are being developed through our formal education system and through our workforce development programs are aligned towards the needs of, uh, of employers. It's really not as much about the employer though as it is about the employee, right? Giving them the opportunity to have durable work uh, and to gain new skills that can help them as we go through this uh, transition in our economy, which will be massive over the next decade. Uh, there are so many changes afoot. Um, so, so those are some things that, that we're, of course, thinking about. I um, would also just share some of what we're hearing from our key marketing targets, and those are site selectors. Um, so EDC Utah markets our business asset to site selectors. Um, and uh, you know they are telling us that they would like to have more diversity in their workforce. And so EDC Utah has really started to um, improve the way that we tell Utah's story uh, with respect to how companies can build a diverse workforce that reflects their corporate values in the state of Utah. Um, our ability to support those corporate diversity goals is just an increasingly critical uh, site, uh, an increasingly critical factor in site selection. In fact, it, according to our data, uh, we do some of our own primary research and, and survey work. It is the number one decision criteria uh, for site selectors outside of what I would call sort of the hard, hard decision factors or bottom line factors like labor costs and real estate costs and insurance and taxes and, and those things. Um, but for the state to hit the target for these for these corporate partners of ours, those like Zions Bank who are invested in ensuring that they can hire the best talent, um, we've got to do a couple of things as a state and there's a direct tie to policy here. Um, and really, in my mind, it's it's ensuring that all Utahns have access to the education and the resources they need to develop into the world class talent that they can be. Um, so eliminating educational uh, disparities, eliminating uh, broadband and uh, having digital equity, uh, eliminating some of our healthcare disparities that that uh, unfortunately force people to be less productive than they could be. Uh, doing removing these barriers and this friction so that everyone can contribute will really empower the historically underrepresented Utahns to build a stronger economy for all of us. 
And then I was just say, share that the other thing that we're seeing or hearing a, a whole lot about is um, Utah has the ability to improve our a perception that we aren't diverse or that we aren't welcoming to diverse talent. Um, we talked a lot at the outset of this conversation about Utah's increasingly diversifying population. Um, and I, I just wanted to put some context around that. We're number 32 in the nation now for the percentage of our population that identifies in the census as non-white. This makes us comparably diverse to Minnesota, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Okay, so states that we th would think of, that you might think of as being more diverse than our own community. Um, and so we need to, to sort of begin talking about ourselves in, a, in, in, a, in using some shared language that acknowledges the beauty of this diversity and, and what that could mean uh, to, to our economy and to our community going forward. We've just proven over and over again, whether it was the Olympics, whether it, Robert, you mentioned it, we have 100 plus languages spoken in the state of Utah. Um, just this last week, we've seen successive governors, including our current governor, Governor Cox, reaching out to welcome refugees and a global population into this state. And um, that spirit of welcoming uh, really needs to translate into a community of belonging where, where everyone can succeed. So those are just you know, my uh, some, some thoughts that I had on, on the matter. And uh, again, a direct tie to policy there, but policy will also inform brand. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and I, I, I want to give the the rest of the panel, if you, if you want to respond as well, um, raise your hand. If not, we'll move on. But okay, and I'm gonna I'll give you give everyone that opportunity with the other ones too. So kind of think through if you want to jump in. If you're just kind of going crazy on any of the others, uh, jump in. Um, okay, next let's move to housing. Um, uh, another easy problem to solve. And, and we're going to go to Jennifer for this one. And um, just because the, once again, the Gardner Institute is such an amazing resource uh, for uh, housing data for the, what, since like the 1970s, 1960s, has just been the uh, uh, resource for understanding and knowledge and information about housing. Um, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's no news to anyone that we're uh, having some housing problems. Uh, let me just give you a, a small example from my own life. Uh, so I bought my first house in 1999, right out of college. Um, my household income was $25,000 a year. And we bought a, a, a $100,000 house. And that, to make that payment, literally took half of my take-home pay. So we were as stretched as someone can be, um, you know, uh, and to buy that $100,000 house. That very house, my starter home from 1999, is now selling or is worth $400,000. So in other words, for someone to be able to buy the house that, that, that I bought when I was, uh, you know, young and poor, would need to make at least $100,000 a year in household income to afford that house. So the effect is essentially, that's not a starter home anymore, you know, so, or starter homes are not affordable to uh, lower income families anymore. Um, but Jennifer, will you give us a little bit of, of, uh, of specifics on what's happening, why it's happening? Um, if you'll pull out your crystal ball and tell us when we need to, you know, dump all our housing stock. But, um, and then also, what do we do about it? How do we address this housing affordability crisis that we're seeing in the state of Utah? You know, it's great if you own a home and you're seeing your home prices go up, but for okay. those young buyers, for those uh, co young college graduates, or specifically those economically disadvantaged people in our community, what do we do to address this? Okay. Robert, I might say something that's going to be shocking, but I went and visited with our housing experts on staff. So we have two incredible people, uh, Dayan Essek and Jim Wood. And um, Dayan said to me that this is the most unhealthy housing market in our lifetimes. And I was shocked. I said, are, are you serious? That's a pretty strong term. He said, Jenny, I'm not the only one using that term. It's being used nationally. The most unhealthy housing market in our lifetime. And really there are a number of things going on here, right? We have a supply issue. So we're estimating that we have a housing shortage of between 400 or 40 and 45,000 homes. 
40,000 to 45,000 homes shortage. We have demand. We just said earlier, we're the fastest growing state in the nation at about 18% over the last 10 years. Um, a lot of people moving into our state and a lot of people staying here and having families here. Uh, Robert, you guys know at the bank, we have low interest rates right now for mortgages uh, under 3%. I think it was 2.93 yesterday when we checked. Uh, it's been pretty consistently under 3% for months and months. Uh, rising housing prices. So you guys are going to be shocked. Um, but the median price in Utah in July was $455,000. That's an increase of 28% from the year before. How's somebody supposed to keep up with that? Our incomes didn't increase 28%. Did anyone on this call have a 28% salary increase? Of course not, right? But how, how on earth um, do you keep up with that type of rising, rising price? And a lot of people assume that it's just happening along the Wasatch Front. That's not the case. Um, Robert, Washington County's median home price is now higher than Salt Lake County's median home price. Wow. All right. I think I'm going to just double check for you. Let's see. $487,000 is the median home price in Washington County right now. So it's a lot. So we have all these factors coming into play right now. And uh, then we have some disparities. And I think it's worth talking about those too. So when you look at the data book, you see some of the disparities that exist among racial groups in our state. And one of those things um, is about homeowners. So on average, about in our state, about homeowners make up about 70% of households in our state. But for some of groups, black or African-American population, the homeowner population is much, much smaller than the Utah average. Robert, you mentioned having to pay 50% of your income when you first bought your home towards your mortgage. That places you in, like severely cost burdened, right? When you're paying 50% or more, that's a lot of money. And we see those kinds of disparities among racial and ethnic groups. Um, for example, for African-Americans, um, about 14% are paying 50% of more towards their mortgage. But in the, in the state, our average is like 6%. It's a big, big difference. And those kinds of disparities are things that we have to be paying attention to as policymakers. So overall, we have, as my friend said, the most unhealthy housing market. And I think for some people in our community, it's really quite severe. And I, I don't know what the answer, Robert, is to that. I wish I had that crystal ball because then I could be on the speaking circuit and making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and going to buy my nice big new home. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it's a great point. And, you know, one of the struggles is it's not only a local problem, but it's also a national problem. And, you know, and so uh, some of the solutions that have been proposed are very local solutions. Um, and they could have a, you know, they could have an impact, things like zoning. Um, you know, or, or you know, uh, trying to build more affordable housing. I, I heard, uh, I forget who it was, but there's one uh, government that is now building houses. They are literally building houses to compete with the private sector. Um, so there's lots of different ideas, but uh, it, this is not just a, a Salt Lake problem or a Utah problem. Uh, you're seeing it in, you know, Idaho and, uh, you know, all, all around the country. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Okay, I just want to throw it to Jennifer, Jennifer and, and Robert. When you guys say unhealthy, is it because it's unaffordable? Uh, we lack, we're not supplying the demand, right? Can, can you guys describe what that unhealthy looks like? Yeah, I think you, you got it. So not enough supply to meet the demand and the unaffordable. Yes. Okay, Teresa, Hi, did Teresa. you want to jump in? Oh, I just, I'm... Um... Someone I was speaking to the other day uh, regarding this topic, they said to me the competency conundrum, and, and you just hit on it, Robert, and that is that because this is such a national issue, but Utah still retains a relative affordability advantage, that even as we continue to solve for, and I think we are making strides, Jennifer, remind me if I'm wrong, but we were at a 55,000 unit gap two years ago. So we're slowly closing it. We're not closing it fast enough. And, but we may, 
as we continue to do work on this, as we maintain that relative affordability, um, we will we will continue to attract individuals from out of state and others whose markets are comparatively more expensive. So it's not something we can just solve and wash our hands of. Like this is something we're going to have to have our eye on for pr probably a generation. You know, and Dan. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One was what you said, this is not just a Utah problem. I think too often we think our problems are only us. They're not, this is a national problem. Um, and then wanted, I mean, Teresa already said it, but wanted to point out there is positive, there already is a positive trend here. We are seeing uh, that inventory gap uh, shrinking and hopefully it continues to shrink. And uh, hopefully um, we still have and when I say we, this is not unique to Utah again. This is a problem all over the country, but a cultural aversion to density. And uh, we need to, to get past that and have planning occurring where we plan for density at that local level. That's where the land use authorities exist. Um, to plan, to, to have the courage to plan for density in their local communities and then allow, allow that density to get built because you're not going to solve this problem with single, single family homes on quarter acre lots. Um, we're not gonna build out of this inventory gap, uh, doing what, what historically had been part of the, the hopes and dreams and the, the culture of, of the state of Utah. So. Yeah, and Miles, oh, we're all jumping in on this one, good. Yeah, you know, and this, this is, shows how important this is, right? We have people that are getting totally priced out of the market. And so it takes a lot of high level focus and attention. Uh, just to underscore Dan's point about the density, you know, I spent a, before coming back to Utah three years ago, uh, Washington, D.C. was home base for me, one of the most expensive housing markets in the world. And over the five, five and a half years I lived in Washington, D.C., it was always in an apartment or a townhouse. Uh, last one, the townhouse, we had five little kids in this townhouse. But that was totally normal. And we loved it. It was urban living. We lived there in like 2008 and 9 and 10. And then we came back in 16, 17 and 18. And even during that period of time, as they experienced their own housing crisis, you saw these uh, uh, high density developments happening along Rockville Pikeway, if anybody's familiar with the Washington DC area, where you had not just you know, five story apartment buildings, but 25 story apartment buildings and, and, and very dense townhouse, but it was urban living in it, there was a lot of appeal and it, it resonated with a lot of people. And so I think here in Utah, sometimes we, we look down on that type of housing but the reality is that we are graduating into becoming a major urban area. And so there is a little bit of a shift in thinking that needs to take place and how we value uh, where we live and what that looks like. And then I think from a, a policy perspective, you know, how do we help uh, support and incentivize this density and zoning? Because the reality is we, we, gotta, we need to increase supply and we need to do that very aggressively given the fact that we are and we have been over the past decade, and my guess can, will continue to be the fastest growing state in the nation. Yeah, thanks, Miles. And, you know, I guess just anecdotally, um, but Jen Jennifer or anyone, if you've uh, seen any of the data about this, I have heard that there are some signs that that housing price appreciation is starting to peak and uh, that it may be coming down. Um, again, that's anecdotal. It's just kind of my discussions with builders, but have you seen any data like that yet, Jennifer? Is it more just anecdotal? Yeah, I'll check with Dayan and um, we'll get back to you, Robert, and see I've, what he's saying. And I've only heard that in the past couple of weeks, but you know, so it's hopefully we're starting to see at least the, the peaking and we're not gonna, I mean, it's just not pos possible to continue to see 28% appreciation in perpetuity. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, uh, as you can tell, I mean, this is why, you know, we're going to be doing, uh, uh, you know, their own uh, separate discussions on each one of these because they're so important. Uh, another easy topic uh, that uh, we'll solve very quickly is healthcare. <laughs> so Dan, let, let, let's uh, go with you on this one. Um, you know, we've been uh, well, you know, we, we've really been working on health care reform uh, nationally and in the state uh, for decades. Uh, you know, if you think all the way back to the Great Society, if you think back to the beginning of Medicaid and Medicare, um, and then kind of fast forward to what we saw with uh, the Affordable Care Act, 
Um, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, more recently, uh, COVID has just kind of thrown it all into, um, uh, into more difficulty. And one of the, the, the real struggles that we've had is the availability of healthcare. Um, and getting that that access. Uh, so I, when I always think about healthcare reform, it's about three things, cost, quality, and access. Uh, but you really, it's almost impossible to get all three of those at the same time. Um, and so what do we do now? We, you know, hopefully we'll be coming out of the pandemic soon, although we're going into a new, um, you know, a, a new uh, spike. But what does the other side look like What's how do we address these disparities? How do we, as a state and as a society, try to achieve greater health equity? Well, I thought my contribution to the last subject matter would be sufficient. <laughs> That's just a warm up. Well, why do you give me this one? This is like the worst one. <laughs> um, so, I like uh, tough issues. No, this is a tough one. You're right because. I mean, because you have a couple of things. One, it's hard to think past our immediate, we're in the middle of a healthcare crisis. And so it's hard to think past the pandemic. And we know even with the pandemic, there are certain communities that are harder hit than others. Um, certain ethnic com communities and racial communities that have had a higher, they've had a higher incidence of COVID outbreak. Um, and with that, a higher incident of, of hospitalization and even, and even death. So, so even access, it, 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 so that one is probably more about access than anything else, but it's, um, you know, man, you're, you're spot on. Like you can't, you can't see quality. Like, so I'm a big fan of Steven Pinker. If, if you've ever read him, he's, he's, he writes books every once in a while. And uh, one of the themes of his books is that while things aren't great, they're getting better. And, and uh, I think that's still true. We're still seeing improvements, but, but you cannot continue to go up that quality of life scale without good access to good, affordable health care. It's just, it's just not possible in today's day and age. And, um, you know, making it, you know, love or hate of the Affordable Care Act, but it did get more people uh, insured. And one thing in our country that is still kind of scawampus, I think, is that none of us or very few of us actually pay for our health care. We've, we've created we call it insurance, but it's not insurance. What it is, is actually, it's a, it's a prepaid healthcare plan where we pay in constantly to access healthcare on the back end. And, um, and so as our healthcare costs have expanded because we do want high quality of care and because we're insulated from the actual costs of those healthcare, we continue to see the costs increase and increase and increase. Uh, there still, I think, needs to be a fundamental shift in how healthcare is delivered and how healthcare is paid for. Um, that is a modification uh, to our existing insurance plan that we have, like which, like I said, I don't think is truly insurance in the traditional sense of the word. It's more of a of a prepaid or continuous paid health health healthcare program. And we're seeing some of these some of these things get better with higher deductible plans plans where we're starting to actually bear the costs of our um, healthcare out of pocket before it goes into a copay part environment. Um, but uh, as we see more of that trends, I think we'll start to be more of a, of a consumer type economy, which is what Americans are good at is consuming. Um, you know, I'll spend, geez, 30 minutes shopping around for a stupid cutting board on Amazon. That's a true story from last night. Um, but I don't spend 30 minutes shopping around for major healthcare type things that have much higher different ticker prices and where you can see bigger disparity in cost if I go here or there. Um, I, I, I don't consume healthcare like I do everything else in, 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 that I consume for whatever reason. And I think it's because I am insulated from the cost given my health insurance. And so I think you need to continue to see that trend of, um, of, of, of me bearing more of that cost so I behave more like a consumer. And I think that'll help with the affordability piece. Um, the access piece, um, we, you know, we do need to help certain communities that traditionally have not accessed healthcare um, from either an affordability or Jeff, just proximity of access uh, uh, perspective. Some states have approached this differently where they've allowed um, freestanding ER type care uh, that's disallowed in the state of Utah. There are some types of, of, of lower cost access points available in Utah. 
um, but they're not the full-scale freestanding e uh, emergency rooms. They're more kind of uh, emergent care or urgent care facilities that are affiliated with a hospital. Um, I, I do think you could do more to bring more uh, care locations out into different communities and particularly communities that don't have the same access. And you could do that through, you know, modifications that would take modifications to state law because right now there's barriers that state law puts in place and, and has some incumbent protections and not to, not to bash in any of the large incumbents, but you probably could see some cheaper models get developed that you do see in other states like Texas, for example, has some cheaper healthcare models. Um, but that would take some policy changes and that would take standing up to some large incumbents who may not want to see that type of, of change because it, it impacts their own sources of, of, of folks coming into their systems. Um, but, you know, you know, we do have to do something to say, how do we get proximity of care out into underserved communities, number one, and then how do we make sure that that care is affordable? Um, and, you know, I don't have a solution to that. Like, like who said it? Jennifer said she'd be on the speaking circuit. I wouldn't be on the speaking circuit. I'd just be running, uh, you know, low cost uh, care units all over. But um, so it, it's, it is a big challenge. But those are those are the things that need to have that we need to have happen. We need to get proximity of care and affordability of care out there because without access to health care. And I know someone put in there something about rider benefit. And I'm not getting into that politically. All I'm talking about are facts with to have a higher quality of life, you have to have access to care. And uh, to get there, um, you know, we, we, we need to continue to see the improvements we haven't seen because things are getting better, but we need to continue to work to make sure and deliberately decide that we will we'll make sure there's access to, to these underserved communities. Great. Let me, since we're, you know, kind of data focus on this, let me give you a piece of data that I just got. Um, this is from the Utah Department of Health. Um, so in January of 2019, there were 40,000 adults on uh, uh, traditional Medicaid in the state of Utah. Today, that number, right now, there are 140,000 adults on traditional Medicaid in Utah. So that's a, a more than 300% increase in uh, Medicaid enrollment in the state of Utah just since, uh, uh, you know, in, what is that, in the last, you know, 18 months. Um, so we have seen, uh, so that, you know, the good thing about that is the state has stepped up and provided for um, a lot of those needs, but, um, you know, it does, and I, I want to throw this out to the group real quick. So is the notion of employer provided health insurance done? Should we, should we end it? If not, why should we keep it? Dan? I don't think it's done. I think it's still a benefit that employers should. And, and you know, as you know, so I'm, I'm working full time for the governor, but I still have a, a, a small business that I was part of. And that was a benefit we offered. And uh, we felt like we needed to offer it to be competitive. And, and so we did offer it. And I, I still think there's a place for employer provided health insurance. Um, but uh, having backstops I think are appropriate for the neediest and and among us for those for whom it, things just didn't work out and uh, I think there it's appropriate to have a backstop which is what Medicaid's trying to provide and so society from a societal basis I, I, I think it's appropriate to have both have your employer sponsored health care um, it would be nice if it wasn't required you know I, I'm, I don't love mandates but it'd be nice if it wasn't required. But my guess is even if it wasn't, most employers would still provide it because it's seen as a pretty valuable benefit to folks uh, in the workforce. Okay, great. I'm gonna jump to the last one uh, just cause uh, we're, we're at about 30 minutes out. Um, so the last one, and Miles, I'm gonna toss this one to you, um, is uh, education. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, a, a really broad and important subject. Um, you know, we, we know that education is critical in, uh, in helping bring people uh, uh, to achieve more equality and, and inclusion. Um, but how do, we, how do we do that? How do we prepare for uh, the, the next generation? How do we give them the, the tools and the skills to be able to succeed 
in the in the modern society and in, in coming uh, with, with especially with the big changes we're seeing in our society due to the pandemic. Yeah, that's a great question, Robert. And I'm going to be interested to get uh, Teresa, Jennifer, and Dan's input on formal education because that's somewhere where where I don't have as much experience. But what you're talking about preparing the next generation is so important. I remember back, I think it was last year, uh, Governor Herbert convened a CEO roundtable on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I remember sitting there, or you know, virtually uh, around the virtual table, looking around, and there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, of of diverse business leaders and CEOs that were there. And so my mind was really focused on how do we make sure that five, 10, 15 years from now, that gathering, no matter what topic it is reflects the diversity of the state that Teresa mentioned earlier, right? We are far more diverse than what we give ourselves uh, credit for, but we just don't see that diversity in these leadership positions. And through those conversations and additional uh, work with, with, with EDC Utah and others, you know, I've thought a lot about that. And from, uh, from what we do do at World Trade Center Utah, which is growing businesses and creating community around that, preparing the next generation of leaders really boils down to uh, helping build businesses that are coming out of these multicultural uh, communities. And we do that, uh, you know, from World Trade Center Utah, uh, originally we just focused in on uh, those uh, multicultural businesses that have exportable products or services. And then we focus on saying, how can we get them some grant funding? How do we get them technical services? How do we get them involved in the international programs that we're doing to help them increase their international sales? And then we realized that we shouldn't limit ourselves just those businesses that have exportable products and services, because we're working with some of the best companies across the state. And all of those companies need service providers. They need accountants. They need website design. They need lawyers. And so what we've been focused on now is saying, how do we reach out into our multicultural communities to identify those service providers so then we can help them connect with these growing, these great growing Utah companies. And in that manner, uh, continue to help grow companies in these communities uh, another way, uh, of course, is we can help develop leaders within organizations. And this is something that, that, that Teresa's team, Stephanie Froman and Z and, and others have done a, a lot of really important work of saying, how can we provide more training to growing companies across the state to help them uh, develop the next generation of leaders within those organizations? And then the last piece is, is how do we help support individuals? And I know all the time, Dan and Teresa and Jen and Sui Lang and Robert, you get emails from family, friends, coworkers, colleagues saying, hey, here's this great young graduate or this great student who's going to university. Will you spend a half an hour and, and help, ta- help them think through career opportunities? And, and, and I inevitably do that. And through that ends up me thinking through two or three other great people that I can introduce them to in the community. That works well if you've got connectivity into this kind of leadership, business community leadership. Uh, but if you are somebody that doesn't have a natural connection into that informal networking that we all benefit from, then you're left on the outside. And so I think there's a, an opportunity for all of us here and working with a lot of the great uh, you know, organizations around town to create mentoring opportunities where anybody out there, even if they don't have a connection to Teresa, Dan, Jennifer, me, or Sue Langer or others, that they have a way to plug into this informal network that exists. And I know that all of us would put top priority on mentoring, on opening up doors, doors, providing advice. And in that manner, we can help change the trajectory of people, of these great young emerging leaders from these communities and help them have more opportunity, uh, just like we do with our friends, families, colleagues, and others. And so it, the, the, the bottom line here is we all have to be very intentional. And we have to think through for everybody listening, you know, what, how does your organization play a role? What tools do you have in your toolkit to help create opportunity to develop the next generation of leaders, no matter what field you're working in? And then how do you apply those tools in a way that's going to deliver tangible results and outcomes? And I know Jevin Gibb from Salt Lake County is a great uh, addition here to Utah, moves from Connecticut. He is hyper-focused on, on this and working with great partners. Brad Mortensen of Weber State, and this gets more Robert to the education component, the way that Weber State has positioned themselves to provide technical training and opportunities uh, for uh, for uh, providing this formal education that then can be a catalyst to more opportunity. 
And then Shelby Dagg from the U.S. Commercial Service just knows that she's on as well. You know, they are, they are our tag team partner on delivering services to businesses to help them grow. And so it really is an, an all of the above approach. Um, but it's something that I think is absolutely critical that we all think about how to do this in a very intentional way if we want to be serious about driving positive outcomes uh, for our, our multicultural communities. Well, that, that, that is a great uh, uh, perspective because, you know, so often when we think about education, we think about the school, right? And, and you really took it outside of that and said, how do we think about it outside of the school? And I think that's a great perspective that you, we so often miss out on when we're talking about education. Um, anyone want to add, add to that? Okay, let's toss it back to Sui Ling. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, wow, I've been taking diligent notes here. Just wanted to respond a couple of thoughts of what has already been shared. I'm having mixed feelings about uh, the growth here in Utah, the population growth. <laughs> and number one, when you were sitting, well, number one, why can't Utahns buy homes in Utah, right? A lot of these people moving, you know, here from California, number one, we still be more, more affordable than California, but still our prices are, are kind of ridiculous. Another thought that crossed my mind as you guys were talking, uh, density, Dan, that you mentioned, density population. Uh, I'm thinking of traffic, right? And Miles, I also moved back to Utah from Washington, D.C. Uh, I moved to Utah to escape rush hour. And I think it followed me. So Dan, can we propose some sort of bill with the legislature that will say, you can move to Utah, but you just can't bring your cars, right? And I think that will help with the air quality as well, possibly. Um, also, I want to say- Lane, I'm sorry, yeah. can I just jump in really quick there? Cause you hit on a really good point. I talked <laughs> earlier about having to leave that urban environment uh, and we actually bought our first home here uh, last year. So Jennifer, I know I was not shocked by the data cause I experienced it. But also, Sui Lang, my wife and I, we live in 11 different places uh, in different countries in Washington, D.C. The first time we had to buy a second car is when we moved to Salt Lake City. Really? <laughs> well, yeah, we got by with one car everywhere else we lived. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, no offense to tracks, but you kind of really do need a car still to use our public transit system. Um, also, watch, we, we just moved downtown in Miles, D.C. prices. Uh, exist here in Utah. Uh, we just moved into a one bedroom um, and I'm paying like what I would have paid on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. I'm like, what is happening here? Also on the healthcare piece, uh, my, my approach has always been your health is your wealth. You know, I think we'd all agree it just takes one healthcare crisis to completely uh, disrupt an entire family's economic situation. Uh, so we could do better there. Also focusing on preventative care. Love what HMHI is doing um, in the world of mental health. That is a critical component to our physical health. They are all interrelated. And then Miles, love how you're talking about a formal education versus I call it informal or experiential learning. I just sent off, well, I'm about to send off a, a a college student. And I feel like parents this generation are now seriously considering if that is the right investment for their child, because there are so many other alternatives, right, to preparing young people uh, to do well economically from startups to the tech industry blowing up, small businesses investing in those uh, things like that. So wholeheartedly agreed with the mentoring piece, investing, investing in people. Um, and that is kind of the where we want to transition the conversation at this point. Um, now, Robert, you and I, when we were discussing uh, this portion of the conversation, there was a question, you know, what is the role and responsibility of business leaders, right, in this whole economic inclusion equation? Um, what we are socializing here at Zions Bank is our tagline, building economic inclusion by opening opportunity, increasing access, and investing our capital. Now, a key part of this equation is investing in our capital. And when we say capital, we mean three things. Human capital, our people, social capital, the relationships, the trust that we build with our teams, with our clients, and ultimately with our community. And then thirdly, our financial capital, which is our monetary investments. Now, I would say investing in all aspects of our capital is what we would love to see more business leaders doing um, and, and everyone else across the community. So I wanna just throw this to the entire panel, right? What does investing in our human capital look like and what could it look like? What about investing in our social capital? What should that look like? What could it look like? And then investing in our financial capital. Um, 
A any immediate thoughts there? Let me just start with Jennifer. Any aspect of capital you want to touch on? Yeah, um, social capitals are one that we talk about a lot, <laughs> excuse me, here at the Gardner Institute, because mm -hmm. we really see that as like this important glue, this foundation that keeps society together and keeps us functioning really well. And there are a lot of components to social capital. Um, it's been defined a million different ways, but the way we think of it here at Gardner is we think about goodwill and fellowship that exists in a community, mm -hmm. established networks and organizations that are trusted, high civic virtue that exists in the com community and effective institutions like effective government institutions. So it's probably not a surprise to folks on the call, but Utah has really high social capital. In fact, the Joint Economic Committee out of Congress ranked all the states and they ranked Utah as having the highest social capital out of every state in the nation. And for those of us who live here or lived here a long time, not surprising, right? We see all that. We actually, we feel it, right? We feel that connection and um, the, the confidence we can have, the trust we can have with our neighbors and friends. Uh, the things that I think are really, really important are just reinforcing what already exists in our beautiful state. And I think that can happen at the individual level. I think it can happen at the business level. So in our office, we do things where we get our staff involved in community efforts, right? So we do the stuff, the bus with United Way every year and get our staff donated money and school supplies. And we take them down and get to see thousands of backpacks that are getting ready to be delivered in the community. Teresa knows this, but we do community events here at our building for the preschool that's next door to us. We're part of our neighborhood here in the avenues, and we have the kids come over for Halloween and do a trick or treat. We have them come over and we have Santa and Mrs. Claus here. You know, those are little things, but they are really important at the very local level that you feel connected to your neighbors, your business neighbors, your, your neighborhood school or preschool. Um, at the individual level, I really think individually we have to be responsible and be part of our community, be active in community organizations, community activities. And there's a beautiful word we've used today, it's welcoming, but to invite and welcome others, especially people who aren't typically part of our groups, to be part of our community organizations and to feel welcomed that they belong. Um, and then the last one I think is really, really important that if you want it to be successful, it has to begin at the children and youth level, right? So you have generational um, success. And I think that's getting your kids involved really at an early age in community volunteering, community activities. And I also think it's really critical that we have civic education in our elementary, junior high and high school levels. I'm a political scientist, I love it, but I also think it's really important that our kids have a real good understanding of how government institutions work and establish some trust and some belief in, in this great democracy of ours. Wow, amen to everything that you shared. I also, on the note of social mobility in the state of Utah, I've heard we have really high social mobility. And I guess I personally feel like uh, I'm, I'm a living testament of that because I've been back in Utah about four years and already I'm in a conversation with Scott Anderson. I've got all these people on this panel. I have direct access to, you know, that is not the case uh, in so many other states. So I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Okay, so let's jump to the other three. One minute, Dan. Thoughts. Um, so I'm going to talk about human capital, I think. Uh, well, and I'm going to focus on inclusion within human capital, actually. Cool. Uh, I think if you want to increase inclusion or have better inclusion within your workforce, you need to make a deliberate decision at the top. Scott mentioned the compact. I would encourage anyone on this to read it, sign it. But then that's just the start. Uh, next step is, I think, to do an internal analysis, know where you are. The, the Governor Cox and Lieutenant Governor Henderson have asked all state agencies to do this an internal analysis of where you are on, on equity and inclusion. And uh, we've done that. And so once you're armed with data, we talked about data earlier. I pointed to you, Jennifer, if you're right above me um, on my screen. But uh, we then have data, and then it takes a deliberate decision to act on it and to deliberately uh, try to improve uh, where you are. And um, so that's kind of what we're doing here at the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity and more broadly throughout the entire state of Utah uh, government apparatus. 
Love that so much, Dan. I would argue the most valuable asset of any organization in any industry is your human capital. So absolutely worth investing in. Teresa. No question. And maybe would just build on some of what, what Dan has said. For us at EDC Utah, I was just personally so shaken by what I observed over the last two years. Um, whether it was George Floyd, the pandemic impacts on our multicultural communities, this new realization about just the fragility of those on the edges of our community. Mm-hmm. And I, I wasn't the only one, right? I mean, so many of us, and we saw this major shift in, in the way that economic development needed to work. So we knew though, if we need, if we were going to position our community differently, we needed to internalize that. And so, um, you know, just speaking for our own organization, it's an authentic commitment from leadership. I'm not a DEI expert. We're not a DEI organization, but we had a contribution to make. So we took exec ed classes. We um, wanted to make a focused um, investment in this area. And it just really helped us understand how to make DEI not a program or a check the box exercise, but really a core part of our work, a core part of how we market the state, a core part of who we target uh, our marketing program towards, uh, how we hire, how we retain, how we think about um, our own uh, com- our own culture as an organization. And, and, and we've just fortunately been able to have so many partners that add weight to that. Um, we added a DEI expert to our team, Zeman Zhao, and she is building out this uh, belongings uh, programming for, for the state. And so we really wanted to take this investment in our, in our own human capital to the next level, really for our own survival. Like we as an organization, we're a nonprofit, we're a mission-based organization. And so we have to invest in our human capital so that we can compete for the type of talent that could walk out this door, you know, this evening and get a job in Silicon Slopes or, or wherever else. So that, that's really our own kind of organizational commitment to this, to this human capital. But I, I would agree with, with Jennifer, with Dan, it's, it's got to start with authentic leadership commitment, but it also, then there needs to be a civic component to it. It's got to start. It's got to start young. So much of this um, sort of academic research just suggests that early education has an an outsized impact on on an individual's ability to achieve and excel uh, going forward. So I think if if we can get that right, it seems like to me all of these other things line up. Like if you get the education piece lined up, then the economy piece should line up, the housing piece should line up, the healthcare piece should line up. You've got to nail that as a community. And I don't have uh, really any of the answers, but I know there are a lot of smart people who are working on it and that energizes me. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. Thank you so much for setting it up that way, Teresa. And I've always admired and respect what EDC Utah is doing and investing in themselves as leaders. Uh, And you guys are, are truly, truly doing the work, right? You can't just say, oh, we're an inclusive organization. We're inclusive leaders. And, and it just happened overnight. You are truly, truly doing the work. Uh, Miles, Love to hear your thoughts. You know, I would just say uh, amen to what everybody else said. <laughs> I think it really, really underscored that we got everybody, Teresa, Jennifer, Dan, uh, great comments, great work happening. And it's just something that we all need to be intentional on and be very proactive in our approach to help develop this human capital. Agreed, agreed. Thank you, Miles. Throw it back to, to Robert. Thanks, Sue Lang, and uh, we're just uh, about to wrap up. So I just really quickly, we'll, we'll make this kind of a lightning round for this one. Yeah. Um, in terms of, so what do you think, what does Utah have going for it? I wanna end on a high note. Uh, why are we well positioned to address uh, the issue of economic inclusion and what can help our state continue to be the strongest uh, in the country. Uh, let's just start off with Dan. Well, we're, because we're the best at all the things economically all the time, that's why. Uh, you know, no, seriously though. Like, confidence, uh, confidence, love it. You no, know, but I mean, when you look at economic outlook, number, we're number one. You look at large cities, uh, Provo Orem, Salt Lake, Ogden. Um, we look at small cities, Logan, uh, St. George, you know, across, you know, rich states, poor states, as far as how well the state is managed, which which has an impact on the broader economy. Uh, all the trends are positive for Utah right now, which, which so to answer your question, Robert, why does this make it so we're poised well to deal with equity inclusion? Because uh, we have the capacity and, and the time and everything else to make it work. And we have the opportunities that are, they're there if we can figure out how to connect 
the 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 individual with the opportunity and and that's that's a challenge but the opportunities are there and they're going to continue to be there for for the foreseeable future um everything in utah is going up and to the right and uh, i think with focus and attention uh, we can help the equity and inclusion piece also start going up into the right at a faster pace. Great, thank you. Jennifer. Uh, Robert, I teach up at the U and people know that last week was the first week of classes and they're in person. It's wonderful. And you know what happens on a college campus? There's just a lot of energy. I don't know how to explain it. You just feel it, you see it. And I am just really hopeful because of that new generation coming, all of these young college students that um, will be our leaders in 20, 30 years that are dedicated, they're intelligent, they have good judgment, they have great moral compasses. I, I think all of that bodes well for our state. Super hopeful about it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jennifer. Miles. You know, Robert, I just say one, I, like Dan said, we've got this powerful economic engine. We're experiencing growth challenges and they are challenges, but it's a whole lot better than other states where they do not have this very robust, powerful economic engine that then generates resources and success and momentum that uh, that we can pull in, you know, groups that are not yet participating to the extent that we'd like. The other one is the Utah way. Right? We know how to get stuff done here in Utah. So we have both the resources, thanks to this powerful economic engine and the resolve for all of us to come together to make progress on these issues. And then the final thing would be that you know, here in Utah, we know how to properly apply pragmatic principles. Uh, our politics here are constructive as it goes through the political process, a good policies come out. And that gives me great confidence that uh, one, we have the resources, two, we all acknowledge uh, the, 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 the problems that we need to address. And we have the, the political culture uh, in the public-private partnership uh, all coming together as Team Utah to figure out what to do about it. And for all those reasons, I've got great confidence that we're going to make a lot of progress here in the coming years. Great. Thanks, Miles. And we'll end it with uh, Teresa. Awesome. Well, hard to follow that great group, but super hopeful personally. And really two things. Best Foundation, Dan already touched on it. The KCG data book tells us we lead the nation in social capital with the highest percentage of income, of income equality and the best ranking for upward mobility. So strong, strong foundation, best in the country. But that doesn't matter if you don't have an authentic leadership commitment. And we have that in spades. Take a look at that, uh, at that uh, compact. And if you haven't signed it, every Utah leader of significance is on there. And so we have a real desire to make this work. And that gives me enormous hope. And uh, and as somebody who's invested in the state, who wants to raise my kids here, who wants them to have great opportunity, that just absolutely thrills me. Great. Thanks. Back to you, Sui. Sui Ling. Thanks so much, everyone. I want to uh, give Scott an opportunity to come back and share any thoughts, closing remarks you have on today's conversations. Great. Well, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Sui Lang, you and Robert for co-hosting this uh, event today. And I really want to thank our panelists, Jennifer and Miles and Teresa and uh, Dan for your comments and, and your insights. As the uh, compact says, and I'll just read you this line from it, we believe many of our nation's social ills can be solved by providing equal access and opportunity to education employment, housing, and health care. And by doing that, we do build a, a, an inclusive economy that truly does give everyone an opportunity to uh, prosper. And so we appreciate your comments. And as I said, your insights on, on housing, uh, education, uh, jobs, the economy, and health care. And I, th I think, you know, I really want to pay tribute to Jennifer and uh, the staff at the um, uh, uh, Gardner Institute, as it says in uh, the data book, and I, I believe this, uh, light shines when we treat data and information as friends worthy of our time and en energy. Decisions made with a thoughtful review of data and context are always better than decisions made on intuition and experience alone. And, and, and then they say, and light shines when we expand economic, uh, expand opportunity for those in need. And so thank you, Jennifer, for putting together this data book, 
for uh, giving us the data uh, that tells us where we are, where we have disparities, and, and how we can understand better the complexity of these measures. And it provides us a, a starting point uh, uh, for evaluating uh, further progress. And as has been said by uh, Dan, I think we really are in a great position we are because of what the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity does to expand opportunities for all Utahns and to um, uh, help us uh, uh, move to a better position. And what EDC Utah does in uh, bringing uh, more investments and more jobs uh, to Utah and what the World Trade Center does in helping businesses expand overseas and also to build a true international community here. And I appreciate what uh, Governor Cox has done in, in providing the One Utah Roadmap. Uh, I appreciate what the Utah State Legislature has done and, and their policies to expand opportunities to all. And I appreciate what business leaders and community leaders are doing in signing the compact and looking at what they can do to help uh, uh, us build this economic opportunity. And so thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Sue Lang and Robert for, for co-hosting this. And thank you for our audience and for your um, uh, uh, chats and suggestions and questions. We really appreciate it. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Scott. And on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out. Um, I want to thank Scott Anderson for making economic inclusion top priority at Zions Bank and for leading the charge to position our community speaker series as a host platform for these important conversations. Thank you to my co-facilitator, Robert Spenlove, and thank you to all of our panelists, Jennifer Robinson, Miles Hansen, Teresa Foxley, and Dan Hemmert for sharing your perspectives, experiences, and insights on your individual roles as community leaders as well as the roles that your organizations play in bringing the vision of economic inclusion to life. Thank you to our community partners, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity, Kem Gardner, Policy Institute, Economic Development Corporation of Utah, World Trade Center Utah, Utah Bankers Association, and the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs. Thank you to our One Zines team, our marketing department on the seventh floor, and Jared, who produces all of our events. He is the man behind the scenes, making all of the magic happen. And thank you to our audience today for taking the time to Zoom in. We hope everyone walks away from this conversation having learned something new. I know I have learned many new things and having been challenged to see something differently. Now, when we are open to exposing our minds to different points of view, we get smarter. We do better and we deepen our impact. Going back to our original theme for today, building economic inclusion through data policy and impact, may we have access to reliable data that will inform our policies that will lead to having an even deeper impact in the communities that we serve. Now, I've already received a whole host of requests for the Diversity in Utah Data Book. Thank you so much for your interest in really taking on this valuable asset, really, in our community and using it to inform your DEI programming. We'll be hosting subsequent conversations on building economic inclusion at the local level across the community, and we hope to continue this conversation at the Salt Lake Chamber's Diversity Business Summit on November 4th. Stay tuned, more details to come. And that concludes today's community speaker series. One voice, one story, one conversation can make the difference. Building economic inclusion begins with us. It begins with me. It begins with Scott, Robert, Jennifer, Teresa, Miles, and Dan. And it begins with you. Until next time, we hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day.